I'm Lisa Feldstein, health and fertility lawyer in Ontario, Canada. In this video, I want to discuss three factors that I suggest intended parents consider when they're deciding on who will be their surrogate. So if somebody's lucky enough to even be able to have um, the opportunity to decide or they're using an agency, these factors might be helpful guides. If someone already has a friend or family member who's agreed, it may be that is certainly the right person. So by no means should these factors change your mind, um, but there are important ones worth considering. And the first one has to do with the surrogates uh, employment status. So in Canada, surrogates do not get paid. It's against the law. They are being a surrogate because they want to be a surrogate. Um, out of the goodness of their heart, it's altruistic. And so what we expect, because they can't get paid, we expect they do not have to actually reach into their own pocket or suffer in any way financially to be a surrogate. They shouldn't be any worse off. And the problem is they miss a lot of time off work if they are employed. And so it can really, really add up, especially if a surrogate has to go on bed rest and potentially miss months of work beyond missing work just for all of the appointments. And the appointments are quite extensive. Unlike um, a pregnancy that doesn't involve a fertility clinic, as soon as a fertility clinic's involved, there's a lot more um, appointments that are required leading up to even becoming pregnant. So there's a lot of time off work. And if a surrogate is self-employed, it will become much more difficult to calculate what the intended parents owe her if they're going to pay her back for lost income. It's a lot harder to calculate when someone um, doesn't have a regular paycheck. So what if they're spending a lot of their time in their business on marketing or admin tasks? There's not any client work being done in that time, but it was very valuable for their business. Or what if they work on some sort of commission and it's a little harder to calculate um, because it's not just about their absence from work. So it's not to say women who have different kinds of work um, compensation models or who are self-employed can't be surrogates, but it's certainly more complicated to be really, really fair and accurate in calculating what are her lost wages. So a surrogate who is an employee somewhere with a regular paycheck, the same paycheck every two weeks, or who has an hourly rate, it's just so much simpler to calculate. The other factor to consider um, sort of on the same theme is if she's employed versus self-employed, um, this can really matter in terms of her eligibility for EI. So ideally we want a surrogate who's eligible for employment insurance because if she needs to go on bed rest or she needs to recover after the birth as most women do, she's gonna be out of pocket missing work for a couple of weeks, worst case scenario, a couple of months. And so if she does have EI, the intended parents will not have to pay her entire paycheck. Rather, they usually just fill uh, whatever gap is. So if e EI uh, and maybe her workplace tops her up, whatever that number is, maybe she gets 80% of her paycheck. If the difference is 20%, the intended parents are only paying 20% rather than her entire paycheck for the days, weeks, or months um, that it adds up for. So those are some really big considerations because surrogacy is very expensive. Even when not paying a surrogate, intended parents are paying tens of thousands of dollars for costs. Um, so that's a big one to consider. Um, I also wanted to mention the importance of surrogates having support. Being pregnant without support can be, would be really, really difficult. So generally that support comes in the form of a partner. Most surrogates do have a partner that they live with who are there to help them, whether that's heavy lifting, taking care of their own children, uh, running errands, being there when their back hurts, uh, when they're tired, uh, when they can't get things done as they normally would. So having a support person to help make sure that they are emotionally supported, physically supported, um, is really, really important because surrogacy is supposed to be a very positive journey. And being pregnant um, on her own can be really, really difficult. Um, and she may need someone to drive her to the hospital if something happens. So there's all kinds of reasons why it really is very helpful to have another, ideally another adult in the household who's there as a support person. Um, and then the last consideration is ideally, um, intended parents should pick a surrogate who has completed her family for non-legal reasons, but just relating to kind of the emotional aspect of being a surrogate and relinquishing a child after carrying it for nine months. Um, it's generally believed that will be kind of psychologically easier for somebody who knows they're done their family versus is still planning on having another baby and might feel conflicted um, or their spouse might not be as supportive if they feel like this pregnancy was supposed to be ours. We're delaying building our own family. It just gets a lot more complicated and can be more difficult. Um, so those are my three suggestions to consider for anyone looking for a surrogate right now. I know it can be difficult and I wish you the best of luck on that journey.